Yeah. You want to get started? Good. It's uh, after eight. And I don't expect anybody else is coming. I don't know that, but uh, I assume everybody knows that I'm John Dillon. There's a few faces that are new to me, but uh, I hope to learn your names uh, eventually. So I also assume that you know that we launched this program called Before Telescopes, uh, an experiment in a way of half-hour public uh, presentations on the history of astronomy, half hour at a time every public night, works out to 15 a year. So I put together 15 half-hour talks on um, the assumption that it was just a, a mix of every possible um, interest and age, and the first two sessions have sort of borne that out. Uh, and I'm still trying to get a feeling of where the middle is in an audience like that. But tonight, since it's docents, I think you're mostly docents, um, and I'm assuming that you know uh, most of what I'm talking about, certainly the astronomy, some of you will know more about it than I do. Um, so I'm going to go over some things uh, very quickly that I think would be mostly a waste of time for you. Um, and other things maybe into more depth than I did in the public presentation. So I've combined the first two half hours into one night because some people said they wanted to hear these. I don't want to do 15 for the public and another 15 a half hour at a time. And besides, who wants to drive up the mountain in the middle of the night for a half hour talk? So the first two are, oh, you do? Well, maybe I'll come over to your house and we'll do it that way. The first one was on what the ancient ancients, prehistoric cultures, um, might have known, what we pretty well know they knew about astronomy or what we can reasonably surmise. Um, and then the second was what extra was learned once we saw the emergence of literate complex societies with writing ability to keep records over a many generations, um, and sophisticated stratification of society. So let's start with the, um, the first category of the prehistoric Neolithic um, knowledge of astronomy. Basically, I'm going to go from th this prehistory up to Galileo. It's before telescopes. Sort of Stonehenge uh, would be the image most people would have in mind for the period I want to talk about. The assumption I'm going to make, I hope is a fair one, is that over the course of these five, 10,000 years that we might be talking about, been a lot of cultural evolution, but very little biological evolution. I think we can fairly assume that the people that we're going to talk about uh, were our intellectual equals. They lacked a lot of information, didn't have access to records, et cetera. Uh, couldn't exchange information with lots of other people, but they were bright, um, observant, um, and they also would have had a predilection, like we do, for finding pattern in nature and f ascribing meaning to it. And one other thing that they, as our biological equals, that they likely had was this confirmation bias you may have heard of is once you've found a pattern, you don't want to give it up very easily. You hang on to patterns that you think you see around you. Um, so let's start at the beginning. What I did with the public, I'll skip over a lot of this, is um, Steve has just told them that this is north and got east and west. So let's start with the most basic pattern, astronomical in nature. Um, the rising and setting of the sun. So you look north, you see an arc of the sun, and right away, you know you must be in Patagonia. This can't be right, okay? Because we can never stand in the northern hemisphere out of the tropics, look north and see that arc. So the first thing we have to do is sort of spin this around, get it oriented properly. And that defines a day. That defines east and west and north and south. Um, and then you turn to the east, and this is the f where astronomy might be said to begin. It's when you pay attention to what the sun does at sunup, 
where it goes along the horizon from solstice to solstice through the course of the year. This is um, so critically important because it defines the whole cycle of life, the agricultural cycle, the blooming, the growth, the reproduction, withering, dying, and rebirth. I mean, there's nothing more basic to wanting to understand for people than th this cycle and how it relates to us as humans. So they will pay attention to these points on the horizon where the sun stops, the solstice word from the Greeks, sun stops. Um, now, observing that, they would have realized that it doesn't work out to an even number of days. It's hard to know some of the details I'm going to be talking about, I'm talking about prior to written records. Um, but if, if they know that this is as far north as the sun got, they wouldn't count 365 and have a big party the next year and the next year after every 365 days. There's some awareness that the days and the year don't match. Um, and also it's related to the height of the sun and all that. We'll skip over that. But here's the image that most astronomy, history of astronomy books begin with, and most people have in mind what the ancients knew, an ancient observatory. Summer solstice, sunrise at Stonehenge. The idea of this as an observatory, I think, needs to be corrected a bit. Um, first of all, the assumption, the common assumption, is as you looked at the uh, summer solstice, sunrise, this is what's being... Um, uh, focused on, but the line that through the um, Stonehenge um, uh, arrangement points also to the sunset of the winter solstice. And there's now good reason to believe that the most important orientation there was not the summer solstice, but the winter solstice. The summer solstice, from then on, the days start getting shorter. Here, the days start getting longer. This has got to do with rebirth. This is a powerful thing to observe. But the reason that I now more and more uh, think that it's improper to think of Stonehenge and places like it, and there are many places like it, as observatories, is because if you're going to observe the solstice for two weeks, here's where the sun will be coming up. One third the diameter of the sun. That's all the further it moves. That's why we call it a solstice. The sun stands still for, for many days. It seems to be coming up in the same place. As it moves here, it'll get faster and faster around an equinox. You're aware. It feels like you can tell from one day to the next that days are changing in length. So they didn't know, standing in Stonehenge, when the solstice was. You can't really tell. The point of this is not to make observations, but to have observances. This is a place of ritual. Now, back in the 60s, there was a book uh, published by an astronomer at Brown University who found all kinds of sighting alignments, alignments at um, Stonehenge, things that might have been used by the ancients to trace the um, positions of not just the sun and the moon, but maybe Venus and other things, pretty much have been ruled out. The statistics are pretty weak behind it. Besides, like the solstice thing, if you've got something lined up and you get tired of thinking about it and you do this, you just threw off all your uh, alignments. It only takes something like this to change everything. If you want to know the best accurate, uh, most accurate sighting of the solstice, Get, get out of the way of these rocks. Get out in the open and look at the horizon. You want that horizon to be as far away from you as you can so you minimize the parallax. You put a stone in front of your face and you do this and you throw the solstice off by miles. Okay, so this is a place of ritual. Recently discovered, they've been doing some work, doing sonic testing of the ground here, they found there are grooves, geological grooves, uh, running around this area that were formed by the glaciers at the end of the Pleistocene moving across the land. Then that period of thawing and freezing and thawing and freezing, the water running in those channels, and that was exposed 10,000 years ago. 
the people living here would have come to this plain. You wonder why would you have this thing built there for observing the solstice? There's nothing remarkable about it. They would have seen these grooves pointing accidentally to the summer solstice. What a remarkable and rare thing. You wouldn't expect to find that anywhere else. When they found such a place, it became religiously, ritually significant. Let's put these stones there. And in over a couple thousand years, they built more and more stones, bigger and bigger stones, some of them from very far away. Now, there are hinges like this all over Britain, something like close to a thousand, thousands more in Europe. Um, and there is no culture, I think, anywhere of any duration at all that doesn't have some kind of a henge-like or solstice-marking site. It may, very few of, uh, with that size of uh, architecture and that much work to put it together. But every culture, even small ones, had a way to mark those solstices. Here's the oldest one recently found in Germany. This one's not made of stones, it's made of wood, it's a wood hinge. And again, to underscore what I said about Stonehenge, this one lines up with the winter sunrise and sunset uh, solstice. So you have to stand here, and then you can observe to those places. Um, hundreds more have been identified in aerial surveys throughout Europe, um, and only 10% have been in, um, actually inspected on the ground so far. So a lot of these are around yet to be... Uh, looked at more carefully. Uh, just a couple years ago, there was one found in the Andes, 4,000 years old, a stone henge, a 2,000-year-old one in the Amazon, in the tropics, where you would maybe, maybe wouldn't expect that. They had stone pillars that they could mark the days when the sun was straight overhead. So the other cycle, astronomical, that uh, would have been looked at carefully is the cycle, the phases of the moon, um, 29 and a half days um, a month. Again, not an even number of days in a month and not an even number of those in a year, not an even number of days um, in a year. None of this stuff matches up. They've got two great uh, ways to tell time and they can't use them together. Most cultures are going to have to decide, are we going to focus on a solar calendar or a lunar calendar? This works really well for the societal calendar, for rituals, because everybody can look up in the sky and pretty close, pretty accurately, tell what day of the month it is. You can't look out during the year and look at the sun and figure out very accurately what day of the year it is. So this was paid attention to. But if they went to the horizon and looked where the moon comes up, as they did with the sun, they would see that the moon also goes through a spectrum of rising points throughout its cycle, but rather than solstice to solstice, it would now be a lunistus to a lunistus. And how long does that take? Oh, sadly, it's not going to be the same as the cycle of the phases. This could have been very problematic. Now, there is occasionally a suggestion that some prehistoric cultures were aware of the fact that although this is the same range as the sun, solstice to solstice, that it moves slightly north of the, of the solstice for the sun and sometimes south of it, and it takes 18.6 years for that to happen. I don't think there's evidence of any uh, prehistoric cultures noting that or um, making use of it, but it's possible. The other thing, obviously, the ancient ancients would have noticed, it's not just the sun and the moon coming up in the east, set in the west, everything does, and there's a point in the sky that doesn't move at all, and that is the one eternal, unchanging reference in the whole of the natural world that can be experienced. That's a powerful thing, that spot in the sky. They would have noted, um, they would have connected the dots, of course. There would have been constellations. Everybody, every culture would have had some 
way to connect the dots. We just do that. It's, we make pattern whether it's there or not because it's easier to organize our experiences. But even though you all know that Polaris wouldn't have been there thousands of years ago, um, the circumpolar constellations, if we go back 5,000 years, would have been nearby. And some of those constellations would have been used uh, as references. And it shows up in things like Homer, um, who um, there's a part where uh, they dis uh, describe how to tell, um, to get back to Ithaca, I think it was. Keep the big bear on your left um, the whole time and you'll sail to the east. So here are the ancients. They have a calendar, a clock, and a compass. They know some basic things and basic rhythms. Oh, and they also, if they moved much, small settled tribal communities wouldn't have been aware of this, but people who traveled by boat, who traveled across deserts, nomadic people would have noted that this uh, distance up to that pole position changed. Um, and don't know if anybody could put that together with uh, the idea of living on a spherical earth, but the information's there and there would have been some awareness of that. The other way to organize time, um, it's hard getting the solar calendar and the lunar calendar together, but you could also make sense of what stars are appearing just before the sun comes up, the helical rising of stars. Um, as they connect the dots, they will learn their way around the sky. They will recognize year after year the patterns so that you can then start pointing to certain things um, that are first seen, like um, Sirius, the first time it can be seen. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me, for the Egyptians, it was a signal that the Nile is about to flood. Um, certain constellations were related to the metaphors and the mythology of the time as a way. There were poetry, uh, poems and things that could have encoded information about how the season works and you know what time to plant and to reap, etc. This is also something that pops up in lots of different cultures, the Pleiades. Um, and uh, as an example, we generally tell the public about this, that, uh, they've heard the Japanese name uh, for the Pleiades. Nearly every culture paid attention to that. I don't think the ancient Japanese had a name for the Matterhorn, but uh, anyhow. So one last thing, we can assume that the prehistoric Neolithic uh, folks paid attention to as they learned the pattern of the stars, they learned the helical rising, they had a sense of where the sun was in the sky, that path, um, and they would have noted that the moon could be seen in those same constellations more or less, whether or not they could paid any attention to a deviation, it's not clear. It's possible uh, because we know the moon goes above and below that a bit. Um, but they certainly would have noted that there were, as when they connected the dots, there were some other dots that just didn't stay still. These were the wanderers. And the one that would have caught most attention would have been Venus, I think. It's the brightest and it's always somehow connected to the sun. Whether or not they would have um, worked out a, uh, a um, chronology uh, of these orbiting is not clear. The moon, if they paid attention, it was possible that they could have seen that the moon is orbiting against that pattern of stars in the same time they saw the lunistus to lunistus cycle. But I think most people would have been more attentive to the phase of the moon and watched where the full moon was in the sky. It's hard, to, again, to know, but it's possible they might have detected this. Venus, it's unlikely, I think, that anybody would have, prior to having the ability to write down records over a long period of time, could have worked out this cycle. It's potentially there. More likely, they would have paid attention to how close it gets to the sun, whether it's seen in the evening, in the morning, whether it's the same thing. That was probably a major revelation for some people to figure out it must be the same thing. Um, and the other planets, 
are all possible. Mars, you can see move over a period of weeks. Um, not as bright. Jupiter's bright, but it goes slow. Saturn's not near as bright, and it goes much slower. So these things are possible, but unlikely. The sun and the moon, for sure, and Venus, probably very important in uh, mythologies. Now, to give you a feeling of something uh, archaeological that's more um, material about what we know that these people would have known, um, this is something that was found just a few years ago in Germany, near where that wood, big uh, wood henge uh, in Gothic Germany was found. This is about this big cross. It's bronze, and it's inlaid with gold. And these are stars. That shouldn't be too hard to figure out. That might be the sun. That might be the moon. Not sure what this is. That could be a rainbow or the Milky Way or some indication that all this goes around. But look on the side. There are these two uh, gold trims. This one fell off, but they did find it. And when they measured the angle, that angle turns out to be the exact uh, spread from solstice to solstice in the latitude where this was found. Here is the very first um, map, in a sense, a graphical map of the sky, a portable um, solstice finder. You could stand there uh, if you pointed north, I guess, and figure out if you came to a new area you hadn't been around where the uh, solstice limits were. The Nebra sky disk, it, it's got a, f a big uh, new age woo-woo astrology follow uh, following now, sort of like the folks that go to the Druid ceremonies at Stonehenge. There's even a, a rock band called the Nebra sky disk. Um, but here is the, the uh, event that would have been the most profound, the most disturbing for prehistoric people. This is not a once in a lifetime event. If you're in a settled community um, that doesn't travel far, the chance of seeing a solar eclipse is about once every 400 years. So unless you had an oral tradition where grandfathers told stories over many generations. Uh, you're not going to know much about this, but when it happens, you would sure like to know why or predict it happening again, be prepared for it. That's the whole point of having this pattern recognition built into us, is to anticipate what we might be able to take advantage of or avoid if it's bad. Um, but to figure this out, you're going to have to keep written records over a long period of time and over fairly wide geographical uh, spread. And so that takes us to the, um, the next subject, which is the first civilizations, complex literate civilizations, that are going to be able to pay attention to some of these um, cycles in such detail that they'll be able to predict a solar eclipse. They'll be able to predict the possibility of a solar eclipse. Important distinction. This is the time when you could say that you got the first full-time tenured astronomers appearing in the world. But then I'd want to put an asterisk after the word astronomers, now at the bottom you say, well, astrologers, well, priests. Uh, their job is to observe, to find patterns, and to find meaning, and to use that either for themselves or it goes up to the king, pharaoh, emperor, whatever, to set the ritual behavior of the culture. So this, what's going to develop now is not, the word astronomy isn't a proper word, it's not just astrology either. So I tried to come up with a word that might capture that. The problem is I don't know how to pronounce it, um, <laughs> and I couldn't look up how to spell it. So um, it's, uh, Astronomy is another possibility. Um, so I want to look at first, uh, for the public um, talks, I had to give some background of what these cultures were all going to figure out that a lot of the public may not be aware of. You will know this stuff, but I'll just repeat it. The explanations that these various cultures will have will not be like our explanations, but it will be un unraveling these things. 
the cycle, the phases of the moon, you go from full, you wane through the, to the new moon and wax to another full moon um, and realizing that the moon is lit up by the sun, which not everybody did right away, but at some point you, this story pops up in various cultures. Somebody figured out that the moon's lit by the sun. But in any case, knowing that, the first reaction would be, okay, how long does that take? Well, as I drew it here, it takes 27.3 days because if we were viewing from here down on the Earth, you know this, that went around, that was an orbit. But the first literate societies keeping track could have noticed where the moon was uh, at this time. And then when it returned to that place against the background of the stars, was only 27.3 days. It's sidereal month, Latin sidera is uh, for star. But during those 27 plus days, the sun will appear to these people to be orbiting the earth, doesn't matter whether we know it's the other way around. It, the observation is the same. As the sun moves um, those extra couple days, the, you don't get a full moon again until that lines up, and that's called the synodic month. The nodes where these things come together join synodic. Um, so these first civilizations would have figured that out. They would have had a different explanation probably. Also, they will need to know that the path of the moon around the Earth is not exactly the same as the path of the sun around the Earth. We call the path of the sun the ecliptic because that's the only place you can have an eclipse when the moon crosses that uh, path. And that crossing is called a node. The problem is we know this is five degrees. And they could have known this, too, by just looking uh, in the star patterns and constellations where they saw the sun, um, where they figured it was after um, everything faded and the sun rose. But right before that, they'll, they'll know what's going on. And then see the moon slightly off. Or if they had paid attention to what I was talking about with the moon's um, lunistus to lunistus spread going off each way, it's that five degrees, but over 18.6 years because these nodes don't stay still. Nothing that goes around and orbits and wobbles in the universe uh, doesn't have a smaller wobble in it. All wobbles have wobbles. Small wobb wobbles have even smaller wobbles, which is why you can't predict at this level that um, there will be an eclipse on a certain day. What you can predict is that there is a possibility of an eclipse that day because small perturbations throw that tiny shadow of the moon off the earth. Somewhere there may be an eclipse, but your village or even your empire may be out of range that day. But these cultures will figure this out. So let's look at these cultures. Now, mostly I'm tracing this history from the earliest we can figure something out about to the beginning of modern astronomy, generally called the beginning of modern science. 17th century in Europe, Galileo to Newton, okay? Um, it doesn't explain all of science, and I'm being a biologist, uh, would have a quibble with that, but let's, for these purposes, we're aiming to that major change in understanding astronomy, 17th century Europe, and so I wanna follow the various information flows, rivers that are going to join the main stream, and one that you would normally skip over are the Mayans. They're on a separate continents, completely outside of the information flow, but they're just too interesting to skip over. So very quickly, a, a few things about the Mayans. This is uh, in Chichen Itza, what's been called the observatory. It's aligned, the doors are aligned with the cardinal positions, but there's been a suggestion that there's all kinds of sighting lines here. As many as 20 different astronomical things have been suggested, but like Stonehenge, a lot of these turn out to be statistically pretty weak. However, there is, um, well, I should say that they were capable of some very precise um, observations. Uh, this one for the length of the year gives you a feeling they wouldn't have written it in the decimal system, but more, more of that in a minute. 
Um, and there is a, a, an alignment here, though, that um, has been accepted pretty uh, universally. Uh, the ed this, uh, side of this building aligns with the northernmost setting of Venus. Venus was really important to the Mayans. Um, they worked out that pattern of the morning, the evening star back to the morning star, the 584-day cycle, as well as the cycle of one uh, orbit. Um, and the fact that it was always either chasing the sun or fleeing from the sun, somehow connecting to the sun, had a lot to do with deciding when to go to war, which was a big um, public event amongst the Mayans. Um, in any case, a lot of attention was paid to um, that uh, Venus cycle. There's another building at another site in Ushmal where it's aligned with the southernmost setting. Venus, they figured out that 584-day cycle um, meshed with uh, eight years, uh, the, a solar cycle of eight years, so that every eight years they marked where Venus would be on the horizon uh, and made some metaphorical um, mythological um, importance out of that. I don't know the details. Here is the uh, Castillo, El Castillo, the castle in Chichen Itza. Any of you been here? It's, yeah, it's a fun place. Um, this is one of the few places where an equinox was noted. Solstice is pretty e easy because a solstice is spatially very specific. You may not know which day to celebrate. The Romans couldn't even figure it out because we got um, Christmas on the December 25th instead of the 21st. But the equinox, most cultures didn't pay attention to because spatially it was somewhere in the middle. You could figure it out. The Mayans built their uh, monument here so that the edge of this thing cast the shadow of their serpent god there on the equinox. Um, but the thing about the Mayans, it's the only culture in the New World with a true, complete, um, sophisticated writing system. They wrote books. Sadly, only four have survived the burning of the books, which every culture does when they take over another culture, it seems. Uh, the priests destroyed all but a, four of them. This one in Germany and Dresden is um, 12 foot long, 78 double-sided pages, all about the cycles of the sun, the moon, and Venus. And the Mayans had not only a sophisticated written language, but a numerical system that was very powerful. It was based on the number 20. Okay, we're decimal, that makes sense. Count on your fingers, that's how it got started. The Mayans looked down, ah, 10 more. And it works fine. You just keep it, you use it uh, um, properly, it works fine. You can get up into real big numbers real quickly. And here are the numbers here, that's five, the dots are one, and here is zero. Concept is zero, powerful thing. So what did they do with this information? As I said, they could work out the length of the year to four decimal places. I don't know how you uh, express it in a vigesimal system, um, but very accurate. But look at their calendar. <coughs> The sort of the annual calendar, the hop calendar, 18 months of 20 days. What, that's got nothing to do with the moon. And that comes out to 360, so throw in another five and call those holidays, um, whatever. You get a 365-day calendar. They knew that eventually it would get out of phase with seasons, whatever. But on top of that, they threw in this completely fabricated calendar out of their mind, had nothing to do with anything in nature, 20 days are given names, and they can be numbered from 1 to 13, so there's 260 distinct days, and then you mesh those together like gears, and every 52 years you can start over, but no day will be like any other in terms of how it's identified. And in addition to that, they had the long count, where they started back 5,000 years ago and kept track of all the days, and what was it, two years ago when it was... The world was coming to an end. Some people believed. The Mayans didn't. The Mayans knew it was an odometer that was rolling over. Um, but, and besides, um, Newton calculated when the world's going to end. It's 
2060, I think, something like that. So silly Mayans. They wouldn't know. Um, anyhow, here's a way to regulate the calendar, what people do when, completely unrelated to anything external to the mind, external to the brain. This is numerology, and it's going to pop up over and over again in nearly every culture. Here's another important, sophisticated, ancient culture that also surprisingly had very little impact on the direction of uh, the evolution of, towards modern astronomy. There was a period about 2,500, starting 2,500 years ago, with the various city state or um, political states, kingdoms, continually warring and fighting, jostling, competing. But it was a time at which written records were being kept in astronomy. The first star maps um, figured out how to predict the possibility of a solar eclipse. Comets, some were noted, and they predicted the return. Uh, a lot of things going on, including natural philosophy, cosmology. This is interesting um, because that doesn't pop up in many of these cultures at this time. But all of this comes to an end with the overthrow or the subjugation of all these other cultures by the Qin Empire, the creation of China. China. Um, from now on, it's going to be an empire. And the astrologers, astronomers, astrologonomers, whatever they are, they are going to be collecting information, giving it to the emperor for the purpose, the emperor's purpose, will be to maintain harmony in society. Now, this gets started by, there's a brutal um, story, famous story of first thing that happens is you burn all the books of the other philosophies, theologies, cultures, and you bury their scholars alive. Um, and now you create a harmonious empire that uses astronomical information to how to decide to keep harmony. Harmony is not a really good environment for the emergence of science. It doesn't do well in a big bureaucracy. This is the largest civil service system that ever existed um, for a couple thousand years. Uh, it's also not good to bury your scholars if you want to get science going well. And so, and every time there's a change in a dynasty, even though the role may be the same, the ast astrologonomers, astronomologists, whatever, are sort of recasting the astronomical information in a new format for the new dynasty. The, um, the first star maps were in that warring state period. Here's the oldest one that still exists. It's much later. Uh, but it's interesting, the Chinese gave position names to all the stars based on the constellation they were in and its position, not magnitude, but position. And that was a, a very early development. Now. Um, almost all cultures have their own way of connecting the dots. But there are a few asterisms that almost every culture recognizes. You probably see one here. Um, that's the pole position that we're looking at. And that one uh, most people could recognize. But if you notice, you go up here and look for Polaris, um, it, it's off. I mean, this group knows about precession. So I did a quick calculation. I think it's about 18 degrees uh, off. I'm not sure, though, how accurate this thing is. We, I'm not sure where Cassiopeia is or whether it's considered an, ast uh, um, an asterism or not in their system. But anyhow, um, it does show the effect of precession over 1,300 years. Now, the way they organized their star charts was around the pole, there were three uh, enclosures like this. So you got down to the zodiac, and the zodiac was based on the moon's passage through the constellation. And it was divided up into 28 mansions, they were called. I, I don't, this is not a subject I know a lot about. I was trying to imagine how they got 28. But, it's somewhere between that 27.3 orbital um, 
periodicity, periodicity of the moon or the phases of the moon in 29 and a half days? Is it sort of in between or I'm not sure how they got it. But then anyhow, that's how they organized their uh, sky charts. Here's another old ancient um, culture, a little closer to the center of action where things are really going to get started. The Egyptians had these monumental uh, tombs oriented to the cardinal directions, and uh, you probably know that from the emperor's, uh, the pharaoh's tomb, there was a shaft, a tiny shaft that pointed to that celestial pole, the one um, unmoving place in the universe uh, where the pharaoh, I guess, was to go uh, on behalf of his people. Um, their calendar, though, was 12 months by 30 days, Seems a little more reasonable, uh, but again, you get 360, you have to add five holidays, and you get a calendar that will drift out of phase. Every couple hundred years, you'll be off by a season. Europe did this until the 16th century, um, because dealing with those fractional numbers is difficult um, to get an organized society um, to buy into, I guess. But uh, another way of t keeping track of time, as I said before, is the helical rising of the stars. And here's a drawing that's supposed to relate that. I'm not sure exactly how it worked. It was found in one of the pharaoh's tombs where um, the pharaoh or the uh, astrologonomer, the astrologer, the priest, um, would be approached such that the head of the pharaoh or the astrologer would be underneath the pole position. So as you looked at this person, the time of night is organized by, in relation to um, this um, pharaoh or astrologer. Uh, by the way, the emperor um, in China was also approached in the same direction so that he was always uh, in front of the pole, celestial pole. The problem, a big problem for the Egyptians was they didn't have a very sophisticated number system, didn't have the concept of zero, but nearby was a culture that did. And this is going to be the one that's going to give us the foundation for everything from here on in. The Babylonians, now this is generally used as a generic term for several different cultures that developed in that Mesopotamian area um, that we now call, and I always have a hard time saying, anything other than a tragic mistake for that area. Um, besides being great gardeners, you know, about the hanging gardens, they were just fantastic at playing with numbers. And it was because they inherited from an even earlier culture. The first culture with writing in this area was the Sumerians. And they loved the number 60. And it's amazing what you can do with the number 60. Instead of a decimal or a vigesimal system, now we got a sexagesimal system, a base 60. It works fine. You can get huge numbers very quickly. Um, and why 60? Well, if you think about all the numbers between 1 and, say, 100, sort of reasonable size numbers that you might use, 10, you can only divide evenly by 2 and 5. 60, you can divide, you can play with and get even divisions with 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 10, 12, 15, 20, and 30. There are so many different ways you can divide that up, and that's what they're going to use their numbers for when they keep records. Now, they know that a year is 365 in a fraction, probably more accurate than that. But you love this number 60. You squint your eyes and you look at that. Oh, that's close enough. We'll call it, we'll say the sun's trip around the sky is divided into 360 steps, not 365 in a fraction. We'll call them degrees, or later that we call degrees. And when you look at that, well, that's easy. That's practically there. That's the number 30. That's how many days there was supposed to be in a month. Okay, and if there's 30 of those, they go into 360 nice so that we can assign 30 degrees to each of those months, which means that the sky, not divided into 12.3, rounded off to an even 12, and each of those 30 degree divisions will be a sign of a constellation that is where the sun passes through the sky on the ecliptic. 
this is why we have these numbers still today. This is why we have 60 minutes in an hour and 60 seconds in a minute. Even the French, after the uh, revolution, with their passion for the metric system, could never inf get away from this. They never forced a decimal system on figuring out how to keep track of um, the calendar and time like that. Numerology again. It pops up in many different cultures. There's this desire to find a pattern in nature and you start playing with numbers and records and you start looking over here more and more to your records and your numbers and you see a pattern there and boy, it's hard letting go of that. Today, we have this too in our culture in Powerball, string theory maybe. Um, some people would object to that. But um, this is going to be the basis for the astronomy for many other cultures, um, eventually today, of course, but it, it's going to impact um, Persians, Indian um, astronomers, astrologers, astrologers, um, Islamic, which we'll get into later. Even China is going to feel some of this um, flow because China was impacted by what happened in India, particularly when Buddhism spread to China. But the Babylonians gave us some other things that are really useful and we use today. As the Earth goes around the sun, or as everybody would have agreed, the sun went around the Earth through that pattern of stars, it created awareness of the possibility of dividing up into 30 degree sectors, and each of those constellations would define the zodiac, the Greek word, the zodiac the circle of animals, since most of them are animals. Um, and we have that today, of course. Um, and this is a mnemonic device that I came across for remembering that, but I need a mnemonic device to remember this one. Um, but even for people that shy away, as I do, from astrology, learning that circle of the zodiac is a very basic and helpful thing to learn um, your way around astronomy generally, observational astronomy. So if they watched um, Mars uh, move through the sky and kept careful records and plotted it against the ecliptic, they then found a way to set up a, a grid system like our longitude and latitude, and you all know this, based on that ecliptic rather than um, the equator of the Earth, but they would start it the place where the, if you projected the equator of the Earth out, where they crossed the ecliptic, that was the beginning for them of the year, the vernal equinox, which at the, that time was uh, in Aries. And you can see it's drifted um, a bit. Um, as astrologers have found a way around explaining that, and I forget what their explanation is. So this is where um, there's something that is maybe difficult for some people to appreciate, but a picture back a couple thousand years or more, an awareness in very great detail of the pattern of the motion of the planets. For instance, they would have been aware of retrograde great motion of Mars and the other planets. Um, the, uh, as I expressed it at the public talk um, a couple of days ago, when you think about the natural world, everything that we experience in nature, by that I mean everything we can see or touch or feel or smell, experience, changes. Absolutely everything changes. The thing that comes closest to never changing is that pattern of the fixed stars that circles and does circle around a point that might be thought of as eternally unchanging. But those fixed stars turning around the entire universe and whatever that power is, there are these seven things that, have, that in some way or another have their own power to work against that. The sun obviously has power. You can feel the power of the sun. You can feel it on your body. It touches your body. And it regulates that season, that cycle of, of life incredibly important. The moon also, you can see that it has power. You can 
Some people were aware of its effect on the tides. Um, it goes through phases, whatever that power is. Mars can move at its own peculiar way against this eternal rotation. These seven things, the what? Excuse me, <clears throat> the wanderers, which is a Greek word for planet, um, were easily thought of as having divine power. And for many, like the Babylonians, they became gods. And this as astrolatry, as it's called, the worship of star gods, is going to be carried along with the Babylonian basis of um, how to observe and keep records um, into other cultures. Oh, and this is the various patterns of the motion of the planets they've been able to work out. So anyhow, that's why I came up with some word that's different from either astronomy or astrology, but what's going to happen from now on as we progress through the development, uh, development in history, astronomy and astrology are going to start spinning apart, taking on slightly different meanings. Astronomy will become the computational part of this, the mathematical part. It's not going to have much to do with meaning or interpretation. This will become really important when we get to Galileo. Astrology will be the part that has to do with understanding the meaning of it all. Um, and clearly it gets drawn into religious, um, metaphorical, mythological things. Um, but starting in a couple weeks in the next talk, it's going to be infused with the beginnings of philosophy. These two things will be working together, but pulling apart and back and forth in a way that we'll, I'll refer to in the coming um, talks. So that's pretty much the introduction for the next one will be the philosophers of nature. What is going to happen in ancient Greece is going to be very different than anything that happened, as far as I'm aware, in any other culture. It's been called um, the only miracle in history, which I think is hyperbole. But then again, the word hyperbole is a Greek word and a Greek concept. Um, so we're going to see something we haven't seen up to this point. We're going to see people arguing about meaning. You can't do that in a big bureaucracy, a police state, uh, empire, dictatorship, a pharaohship, a kingship, emperorship, whatever, where you're free to argue in the agora, the agora, the marketplace, there's the possibility of new scientific approaches, new theoretical approaches to understanding um, and interpreting data. That's possible, and that's what I'll talk about the next time.